la the last sun the last Sunday in January, can you believe it's gone by this quick? Not five Sundays, man. Amen. Five five Sundays, man. So go with me. Last week we looked at Luke 16 about the rich man that was in, uh, that's still in hell. I don't say it was in hell. He's still there. Uh, eternal 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 damnation does not end because you think it ends. Eternal damnation is exactly like eternal life. It goes on forever. So last week, we looked at Luke 12, we looked at Luke 16, uh, we drew a couple of uh, other verses into the whole thing. I want to give you the last New Testament usages of the word hell in your King James Bible. Acts chapter 2. I know I don't have to repeat it to you folks, you're Bible believers, but I don't need the Greek to tell me what the word hell means. It's not Sheol, Tartarus, Gehenna. It's not a dump outside of Jerusalem. No, it's a place called hell. It's a place in the center of the earth that is burning right now where souls that are lost are inhabited. And if someone happens to die today, which they will inevitably because people are born and die every day. I think one person dies just about every, what, 38, 40 seconds in the world. They're either going to heaven or hell. If they're saved in Christ, they go right to glory. If they die in their sins, they go right to hell. That happens once a minute. That's pretty freaky when you think about it. The Bible says this. That's why it's important to preach on hell, talk about hell. That's why it's part of our doctrinal statement. When other churches are putting aside hell and putting away hell because they want to please the masses and tickle people's ears, hell has still not been removed from that King James Bible. It's still in there. Bible says this, pick it up with me, and, uh, oh, verse number 22. Verse number 22 of Acts 2 says, Ye men of Israel, that's your audience that Peter's preaching to, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved to God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou didst not leave my soul, here it is, didst not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, who is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, that would be David. He's not just the psalmist of Israel. He's not just the king of Israel. He's not just a shepherd boy. He's a prophet by God's Bible definition. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has had sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, that's what a prophet does, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Brother Kenny, pray for us this morning, please be good. Thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us all together <clears throat> this morning. I just pray that uh, we would take from your word what we need today. Again, teach us more what we need to warn others about hell. Uh, Amen. Last long, but to take our notes that are hidden away and just use it when we uh, when we see others and see lost in that world, dying world. I just uh, pray for this morning hour that we preach to us, teach to us, to our hearts. When it comes to the uh, morning services to honor and glorify you for the singing and praise. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go back to Psalm 16. Go back to Psalm 16, please. What was, did you say a reference that that was the last mention of hell where? No. Acts 2, you said? No. I, no I, want, I want to give you the last references in the New Testament oh, okay. to Acts. Yeah. We stopped in Luke 16 last week. Then there's a break. Then the Lord picks up in Acts 2. Then you'll see another break in the Pauline epistles. And then he picks up in James and goes out. So I want to, I want to cover the last usages of God's word with hell in the New Testament. Um, go back to Acts 16. I know we hit on this a little bit last week, but go back to Acts 16. 
Please. Uh, ah, okay, Psalm 16 would be the passage I'm looking for. Psalm 16. Brother Pete throw me a curveball. That's why I messed up now. Psalm 16, please. Brother Guido, go around to Sunday school, have some reading. If you could read uh, 1610 and 11, please. A psalm. This is this is your reference to Acts chapter 2 that the prophet David said back in Psalms that the Holy Ghost or Peter brings up at the day of Pentecost. Go ahead, Brother Guido. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Now that is a reference going over to Psalm chapter 2. That's your match beat. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his soul did go to hell for a period of time because. It couldn't stay in hell. It had to go meet the thief in paradise based on the promise that Jesus Christ made on that cross. There is no discrepancy in Scripture when the Lord goes to hell, the place that was burning, and he also goes to paradise to meet the thief. There is no biblical contradiction whatsoever in that. You can't make him go to hell for all three days and three nights. And you can't make him go to paradise for all three days and three nights. Go with me back to uh, Exodus tw chapter 12. Exodus 12, please. Exodus chapter 12. Second book of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus. Talking about the Passover lamb here and the, the establishment of the Passover for the nation of Israel as they're about to leave Egypt. Brother Pete, can you read uh, verses 3 through 10? Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 12, 3 through 10. Sorry, go ahead. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. And every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats, and he shall keep the cup until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly out of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, yeah. and unleavened bread, yep. and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. But roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the uh, pertinence yep. thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. How many times you see fire in that passage regarding the lamb that Israel was to offer for the Passover night? What else is interesting is this is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ as the lamb which taketh away the sin of the world. Look what the Bible says, folks. In verse number 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire. Look at verse number 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sod it all with water, but roast with fire. Jesus Christ does go to hell. In fact, when he's on the cross before he dies, what's one of the last things he says? I thirst. John 19, 38. So part of that payment, part of that hell, Part of that punishment is starting to come on him before he gives up the ghost and dies and that soul goes down to the lower parts of the earth. That's foreshadowed by what goes on in this Passover night in Exodus chapter 12. It's interesting, real, in verse 6 it says, verse 6 of the same chapter, and you shall keep it uh, up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. Who did you read was responsible for crucifying Jesus Christ? The whole congregation of Israel. His blood be on us and on our children. That is foreshadowed several thousand years before Jesus Christ walks the earth. You don't think God knows what he's doing? Yes, the Romans were the button men. But you know who said we don't want him as our king? The Israelites. They said we don't want anything to do with that king. He's not, the king. He's not our king. Caesar's our king. We will have not. This man's not going to reign over us. Okay. Then I'm just going to have every Gentile chase you for the next several thousand years until the tribulation period, and then the millennial kingdom when you get to be restored as the head and not the tail. But you better know it. I'm coming after you.
for that thing right there. And then afterwards, all those chapters in Acts where the Jew has an opportunity to take their Messiah, their Savior, and they say no. And then in Acts 8, you have the Ethiopian eunuch get saved. You have the apostle of the Gentiles called out and saved in chapter 9. The Gentiles saved in Acts chapter number 10. The Christians are first called Christians at Antioch in chapter 11. And God flips the script from Jew only, nation of Israel, to Gentile individuals. And that's where you and I get in today, 2,000 years later. Where God will save a Gentile by grace through faith. He'll save a Jew by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and make one body out of those two folks in Christ. All foreshadowed back here with the whole congregation of Israel is going to cook that lamb. But what do they all say? We don't want him. You, you kill him, Pilate. You do something with him. Boy, that's a lot to bear for, for a nation when God sent you their Messiah, your Messiah and you say, no thanks. That's somewhat like, somewhat like lost people do today. You tell them about the grace of God, the mercy of God, what God did for them on the cross. No, nope, I got it. I'm all set. Don't need any help on that one. Well, you're saying the same thing, not nationally, but you're saying it individually. Same deal. Go over with me to uh, show you something neat. Go over to Luke chapter number 23. Actually, on your way through, go to Isaiah 53. Go to Isaiah 53 on your way through, please. Isaiah 53 on your way through. We're teaching about hell, and I want to. I'm part of this where we're at now with the Lord Jesus Christ. We've mentioned it in the last couple of weeks is that hell's a real place. It's so real that Jesus Christ went down there to take care of that sin problem. He shed his blood on the cross. Yes, he rose from the dead, and we're justified by that resurrection. But you know what? He made a trip down to the lower parts of the earth first. And he went to hell for us, and he also went over to paradise to meet that thief. Look what the Bible says. Uh, Brother Paul Ravelli, can you read 53, 10, 11, and 12, please, of Isaiah? Okay. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. But thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. There you go. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall speak of the travail of his soul shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their inequities. Therefore will I divide them a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Mm -hmm. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Verse number 10, the Bible says that his soul, an offering for sin. Verse number 11, of his soul and shall be satisfied. Verse number 12, he hath poured out his soul unto death. Jesus Christ's soul went down to the lower parts of the earth. And that soul was the offering for my sin. Yes, his body was bruised. Yes, he shed his blood. you got to understand something, folks. Our salvation is so complete, you couldn't get it anywhere else. Everything you'll ever need for this life, but more importantly for eternity, is found in Jesus Christ. He gave everything for us on that cross. He shed, he, he poured it all out. Nothing left for him on that, uh, nothing left for him to offer on that cross. He poured it all, he poured it all out. Every bit of it. What a great redeemer, what a great savior, what a great king. I'll show you another one. Psalm 139, please. Go back to Psalm 139. Brother Bert, what's up? Hey. Psalm 139, please. Psalm 139. Jesus Christ did pay a trip down to hell, and I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not repeating myself from last week, but part of our study on hell is you understand the great price that was paid by God for your my, your my sin. The Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 2 that by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. Can you imagine someone, I'm just I'm playing this out in my imagination, can you imagine somebody that gets to the great white throne and says, you have no right to cast me into that fire, you don't know what it's like to go there. That's what somebody would say. Or you don't know what it's like, what I go through. And the Lord can say, well, I was tempted at all points like this. You are yet without sin. Jesus Christ did everything for us. Our example, our ensample, in every way, shape, and form. And quite bluntly, such mankind has no excuse. Man has no excuse when the God of the universe comes down here in a regular body and goes through everything that you and I went through and came through it spotless. 
That includes going down to hell, crossing the gulf, meeting the thief in paradise, and taking the whole jailbreak home three days and three nights later. As I said before, there's no contradiction in the Bible where the Savior can't go to the place called hell and over into paradise. There's no contradiction whatsoever. I remember years ago, we were up in, up in jail ministry, and we had, a, we had a kid there that had participated in, in uh, Satanism, was pretty heavy into it. And one of the tenets of Satanism is, or, you know, it's all about self and all that stuff. It's not just about sacrifice and all those things. It's about, you know, you're your own God and all that stuff. But, you know, they do, they do worship Lucifer because that's the first guy that said, I will, I will, I will. But the kid, the kid up in jail, I mean, we're going back, wow, a long time now. But the kid said one of the things that uh, the Satanists teach and that's found in their writings is that Jesus Christ is still bound in hell right now being tortured. Because they want to keep him weak, defeated, because our glory and our power folk is in the resurrection. Without him risen, risen from the dead, we're of all men most miserable. Shut it down. Let's go fishing. If he's not risen from the dead, just pack it in, man. Burn your Bible. Who cares? But because he's alive, we have something to say to a lost world. We have something to proclaim and go through. And if you keep, if you, if you, if you keep him, th this is what happens. If you keep him in hell, like that Satanist kid said, he has no power. If you keep him on the cross, which is what Ishtar Day does, or you keep him in a manger, what X-Mass Day does, he has no power. Well, let me tell you something. He has all power given unto him in heaven. He's alive. And by the way, he's doing really well. He's doing real well. He's not the babe in a manger. He's not hanging up on a cross anymore. And he's not suffering in hell. He's alive with all power given unto him. He's just waiting to come back. He's just waiting to come back. Yes, sir, go ahead. Oh yeah. It says that the demons were on Jesus back and torturing him and that the prophet father was facing and he was concerned whether he could get back out of it. Those are her words. They also very quickly without getting off on this massive rabbit trail, I don't want to do that, but they believe Jesus Christ was the first born again man in hell. They believe he was that's the charismatic movement, that's your uh uh, uh, Freddie Price and uh, Catherine Coleman going back and Benny Hahn, Benny Hinn and all those fools. He was the first born again man in hell. That's where he, when he came, he was born again. No, you need to be born again. You need to be regenerated, not Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with it. We just read in Acts chapter 2. You know why you couldn't keep that man down? Because he never had any sin. It's not possible that he could be kept down. You couldn't keep him chained down. The weight of sin's death. He didn't have any sin. He bore my sin. He became sin. He didn't have any sin of his own. That's why you couldn't keep him locked down in death and in hell. Go with me to Psalm 139. Brother Kenny, I need you to pick it up in verse... Uh, this, this is a really great... Can you read uh, verses 1 through 8, please? Psalm 139, 1 through 8. To the chief musician of Psalm of David. Amen. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compass my path and my laying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not, <clears throat> not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? Look at this. If I ascend up into heaven, uh, okay. thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. <laughs> what a crazy thing. I can't get away from God even if I go down to hell. And just remember that, think about that thing churning over in your head and your heart and your mind, particularly now the gospel age. When somebody handed you a gospel track and you said no, and that thing just plays over in your memory. Like we saw the rich man last week. I've got five brethren in it. I don't want him to come here. And I remember how good I had it up there, and I don't want him to come down here in this place of torment. And you think about that. I can't go to heaven. You're there. I can't go to hell. And you're, you're there. You know why that's even more important now? Did he not go down to hell for us? You're not going to lay that on me. I've been there. I'll show you another one in regards to that. Go to Amos chapter 9. Please go to uh, 
Amos chapter number 9 and 1 through 4, if you could. Amos 9, 1 through 4. It's page 914 in your Bible. You know. Just here to help, man. I'm here to help. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Look at this. Though they dig into hell, then shall not mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. You just read that in Psalm 139. Go ahead. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. Though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, then will I command, command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Ah. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, then will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Where, wherever you go, God's there. He said, you can dig the, you can dig yourself to hell, and I'm going to find you. You can go wherever you want in this earth, under the earth. You can go up to Mount Con You can go wherever you want. I'm going to find you. You ever heard a phrase out in the world, dig to China? Right there, man. Now in the cartoons, if you dig through, you go all the way, you do end up in China. Bunch of, you, know, you end up on the other side, you wear the crazy hat, and you're on the other side of China. But digging in China, that's right. You can dig to hell, and God, according to Psalm 139, well, His Spirit, you, you're, you're going to get some sort of form or visage or spirit that God, that God has been there. You're not going to escape it wherever you go. So why don't you just get saved by grace through faith? Why don't you just take the blood atonement for your sins? Why don't you avoid this craziness? A man at his base is just so rebellious and stiff-necked and hard-hearted, just so against the God of the universe, just by nature. He won't take it. He will not take it. You want to take go with me to uh, Luke 23. Luke 23, please. I'm not, I'm not trying to belabor this or get to the sidetrack of uh, everything that happened to the Lord, but I want to just make this point clear about our Savior. Uh, going to hell. So here you go in, in Luke 23. Brother Guido, can you read Luke 23, 46, please? Luke 23, verse 46, please. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yep. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Amen. So, I'm just doing this because where did the Spirit go when he's on the cross? Spirit goes back to God. Okay, Stephen said the same thing in Acts chapter 7. Your companion to that verse is Ecclesiastes 12.7. If you don't have it already. 12.7, Spirit goes back to God. Okay, that's all part of God making man of the dust of the ground. He becomes a living soul after God breathes in him. Okay? So, Jesus Christ, he Spirit leaves his body. He's dead. Okay? When the spirit leaves, you're gone physically. Now go with me to John. Just a quick recap. John chapter number 19, please. John 19. What was that reference before Ecclesiastes day? I'm sorry? We had another reference before Ecclesiastes. What was that? About uh, Psalm 139, the one where the spirit's in hell? That's it. That God's in hell and heaven. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay, that goes along with the Amos 9 too as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John 19, please. So he, he gives up. That's a good Bible definition, by the way, of spirit and ghost. The guys that want to argue about pneuma and, and, and you know, and, and spirit and ghost. And listen, if you read it carefully, God does use them specifically, but don't strain it in that swallow a camel. He just defined you what spirit and ghost are. He just he just defined it for you. Well, you know this oh, oh, oh okay. Okay, uh, Zodiades, and whoever else you think you are. But you got hate in your name, I ain't read your books, man. But anyway, I mean, it's, it's Zodiades. But I mean, honestly, he just defined, again, let the Bible define itself. Do you know you have a built-in dictionary in your King James Bible? You have actually, you have a built-in dictionary in your Bible where you'll read the first part of a verse and go, 
what is that? And then he puts a comma, and then he uses the same phrase, but he uses a different word to explain the hard word you didn't know. And you bracket it and go, I don't have any clue what that word is. And before you go to Webster's, the other inspired book of the Bible, the 67th book of the Bible, before you go to the 67th book of the, uh, you know, the canon of Scripture, why don't you let God explain it to you by reading the next passage or the next part of the verse. And I guarantee you, you bracket that hard one, he'll give you the explanation within a verse or two and explain to you what that hard word was. Unless, of course, you come upon Wimple or Crisping Pin, then you might be in trouble. We'll talk about that later. But you know what a Crisping Pin is. That's what women use when they get their hair ready in the morning. It's curl iron. Never mind. We're not even going to address that. That's on film right now. Good job, Kenny. Uh, John 19. Brother, brother, <laughs> brother Pete, can you read 19? Can you read, can you read 1938 and go to the end of the chapter? Please, 1938, please. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, the secrecy for a fear of the Jews, <coughs> besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. Yep. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first, came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Mm -hmm. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day. Thank you. So what did you have in Luke 23? His spirit. What do you have here? His body. And then we covered the soul in Acts 2. So all three things are accounted for in the Lord Jesus Christ dying, including his soul going down to hell first. And then, keeping his promise of Luke 23 to the thief, the repentant thief, to meet him in paradise that same day. Spirit, soul, body, all accounted for by the Lord. That's pretty neat. I'm not going to get into what he preached tonight. We will go home and we'll hit that right now. We'll save that for some uh, some moonshot night, man, because that's a, that's a crazy one. I, just to say this, in case, uh, because we'll get into it maybe in the last few minutes here, a soul is not some disembodied vapor floating around. A soul has arms and legs and mind and memory and thirst. and It has, it has everything. In fact, it's the real you. Jesus Christ said in Matt, uh, Mark 8, For what shall a prophet make for you shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You know what he says over in Luke 9 in the same companion? What is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose him self? You know what the Bible just defined for you the real you is? Your soul. Not this stuff. All of us are attracted to feeding this stuff, saved or lost. We're all geared towards this guy if we let him control our lives. Jesus Christ said, no, the real you is your soul. The one you can't see is really who you really, that, that, that's the real deal. That's the self. How about that for a self-improvement seminar? We're going to talk about your soul today. What? Psychiatry or psychology, whichever one you pick. Psyche or suke is the word for soul. Why is it when you go see one of those guys who are paying 300 bucks an hour, they want to deal with your mind and your childhood regressions and your dreams on They want to deal with this. When psychology is the study of the soul, and none of those guys have a billy goat snowball chance in hell, man, of stinking telling you about your soul. They're going to take you to Freud and Jung and Wilhelm Wundt and all the Abraham Maslow. They're going to take you down all through that foolishness. You need the real doctor of your soul, Jesus Christ. He's the one that can give you the real psychology because the real problem is inside. That's what affects this thing. The soul's a real deal, man. The soul's a real deal. Let's do this. Let me give you the last references in the New Testament. I promise you I would. Go to James 3, please. James 3. It is interesting. I was talking years ago. Brother Bert and I were talking about this. About uh, It is interesting how hell is not used in the Pauline epistles. That doesn't mean there's not a hell. James chapter 3. It doesn't mean there's not a hell. It's just different words. Condemnation, damnation. There's, there's different words that God uses to describe hell. But it is interesting how it doesn't appear in the Pauline epistle. Just neat like that. It's not, not trying to 
like I said before, not trying to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. I'm just trying to bring it up. A pretty neat thing. That God would omit that in those, in those. I mean, God says a lot by what he says and what he doesn't say. He does leave out things intentionally in the Bible. Not to leave to your imagination, but to say, I'm silent on the subject, so shouldn't you. Preachers that get involved in stuff that you have no Bible basis on, you ought to shut your mouth on that. Unless you say, you know what, I'm just taking a shot at it. I don't know. I got a couple verses here, but really how it plays out. I don't really, I don't really know the end of it all, but I'll just I'll give you a couple verses. Maybe you go think about it, pray about it, and have the Lord give you an answer. But some of the stuff folks preach that is doctrine, you've got like one word out of one verse. Or if you find that and you teach a whole teaching on it, man, run the other way. Uh, Brother Kenny, are you up next? James chapter 3, did you just read? Or, uh, Brother, Brother Pauly, James 3, please. Uh, verses 1 through 6. My brethren, be not many pastors, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offended not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put this in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they may be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, mm -hmm. whithersoever the governor listened. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Look at this. And the tongue is a fire, a world of inequity. So is the tongue among your members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. Look at this. And it set on, on fire of hell. Thank you. Now, this is where I want to invoke, write the divine word of truth and say that doesn't belong to me, it's the 12 tribes scattered abroad, but <laughs> that just goes to show you that every word of God is pure and all scripts give it, it's rich God, it's profitable for something. You know what, I'd like to say, you know, Lord, that, uh, that thing about the tongue, that's actually to the 12 tribes, he's like, yeah, really, okay. <laughs> but in the middle of that, you know, the middle of that tongue thing, he says, what? Fire of hell. Folks, hell is not the grave. Hell is not some place you just go and kick back with your friends. I know you know that, but we need a refresher course on it, so don't I. So you start seeing people that, you know, are heading. Folks, if they're not saved, they're condemned already. They're a child of the devil. It's not funny. They're, they're as good as gone, except for the mercy and patience of Almighty God, waiting for one of his kids to go talk to him. There's fire. He, he, the Bible says even the tongue's involved and set on fire of hell. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, please. Over in, uh, without turning there, over in Matthew 12, 37, you say, well, how's that time with the tongue? 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. Over in Matthew 12, 37, it says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Your tongue, let's fast forward today to the gospel of the grace of God age, your tongue can either save you or send you to hell. I know, I know Jesus Christ saved I understand that. You know what I mean when I say your tongue can save you. You can either choose to take Jesus Christ to pay for your sins or say, no thanks, I don't want it. And God says, okay, go to the fire of hell. Your, your mouth, buddy, is the one that puts you there, not me. You know who hell was prepared for on ultimately the lake of fire? According to 25, who was, who was that place made for? The devil and his angels. Mankind goes there through his hard-headedness, stiff neck, that heart that's so just full of itself and says, I will not do what God tells me to do. And you know what God tells you to do today? Take my son by grace through faith to save that soul. I will not. Out of the, out of the tongue, you just condemned yourself. For all eternity, you condemned yourself. You know what? You have the final say on where you spend eternity. You have the final call of where you're going to go when you die. You make that call while you're alive. Look at the Bible says over 2 Peter. Brother Kenny, can you read uh, verses just for, and I understand there's a break, uh, uh, there's a break in the, uh, with the, the punctuation, but can you read 2, 1 through 4? 2 Peter 2, 1 through 4, please. But there were false prophets also among the people, even 
as there shall be false teachers among you, who mm -hmm. certainly yep. shall, shall bring in damnable heresies, even deny the Lord that brought them, and bring them, bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by yep. reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And though and through, yep. and through covetousness shall they with feigned feign feign words, words yep. make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Here's your reference, verse 4. For if God spread not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Thank you. Again, another verse that tells you what direction is hell. Exactly. Down. Huh? You're not, you're not going to beat this King James Bible in any way, shape, or form. He even gives you the direction of where hell is. The Bible says over Proverbs, I'm trying to figure the reference out. Hell and destruction are never full. They go over Isaiah 5.14. Hell hath enlarged yourself. There's enough room down there for every soul that's lost. And I mean the lost of all ages, not just the lost from our church. I'm talking about the lost. And then God's going to cough them up at the great white throne judgment. They're going to death and hell going to give them up. And they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment and then be cast in the lake of fire. What a horrible, horrible thing. And churches don't want to talk or preach about hell anymore because we're just about loving and inviting. You can love people and still tell them there's a place called hell. That's the greatest love you can show somebody is telling them they don't have to go to hell. Well, just love is hugging. No, the greatest love in this was the love of God manifest and that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You want to know what real love is, folks? Jesus Christ on a cross. Not Hollywood, not soap operas, not YouTube. It's Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. That's real love. That's the greatest love of all. Greater love hath no man than this than a man who lay down his life for his friends. You talk to some soldiers, that's huge love. He died for his enemies, people that hated him. Still hate him to this day, and he still wants to save him. Wow, man. Wow, wow, wow. wow. I, honestly, folks, i, I got to tell you, that's still part of me is lacking. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, please. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, Brother uh, Burke, can you read 16 through 20? Revelation 1, 16 through 20, please. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive amen. forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death, hell, and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which thou are, uh, excuse me, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Here we go. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Amen. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. Bring up in verse number 18, one of your last references in the New Testament. You know who has the keys of hell and death? Jesus Christ. You want to get out of hell? You want to get out of the second death? Go see the one that has the keys. You know why he has the keys? Because he went down there to that place surrounded by a gate and he defeated every bit of it. Took the keys and said, let's go. You know who had the power over death before Jesus Christ did? The devil did. Hebrews chapter 2. And everybody was in fear of that and bondage all their lives because of that death thing. And then Jesus Christ came. And said, well, Brother Burgess read it. He read all this stuff. He's got the voice, the many waters, the feet is brass burning, the first, all this stuff. You know what he says right in the middle of that? Fear not. I have the keys of hell and death. You don't have to fear one bit about going to hell if you're saved. He unlocked that prison 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago for some of you folks. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hell's not even on the table for me. Amen. Getting stung by scorpions and dying a vicious death with bullet ants, that's a different story. Hebrews, uh, Revelation 6. I'm just saying that could... You know what? I know that's a 
the way some of you guys are praying. That's okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good. Revelation. You, you can make it through life with some good friends, but one good enemy will last you a lifetime. <laughs> Revelation chapter 6. Brother Guido, can you read uh, verse number 8? 6 8. This is personified, by the way. You'll see the capital here. Go ahead, brother. And I looked and behold a pale horse, his name that said on him was death. Hell power was with him. Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, killed with sword and with hunger and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Revelation chapter 20. Right there, he's personified. That's coming, that's coming out in the tribulation period with that pale horse. Uh, I know, I know we can't, we're not supposed to talk about movies because I know we're going to go to purgatory for a few years, but do you, you guys remember a movie called Tombstone? Yeah. And they got, oh, you guys are all lost. You got, <laughs> tomb, tomb, thank God we got somebody that saved him, brother. But Tombstone was a movie, and at the end, uh, Wyatt Earp says, you can tell the Ike Clayton, the Clayton gang, that, uh, 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 that I'm coming and hell's coming with me. Yeah. And they take it from that. You ever, real quick, you ever notice that Clint Eastwood, his movies, rides a pale horse? Yeah. In fact, one of his movies is called what? Yeah, right. And what comes with it? Death? So, they're reading the Bible. I hope you're reading the Bible. Hollywood's reading the Bible. Because mm -hmm. they know that's the story itself. Mm -hmm. He always has a white Appaloosa or some sort of Arabian in those, all those movies. Every one of them. It's that pale white, everyone, or he's like Jesus Christ on a white horse bringing judgment to a town. You say, well, you're bringing us up. Because it shows the Bible's true and everybody's just thinking, why don't you just get saved and read it for your own edification instead of trying to make money off everybody with it. Crazy stuff, man. Revelation chapter 20, please. Last two references in your King James Bible. Brother, uh, if we don't pick it up in verse number, um, verse number 11 and read through 15, please. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, please. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and who space the earth and the heavens went away. And was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Yeah. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the devil mm -hmm. were in them. They were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Mm -hmm. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. Thank God there's no more hell after that. Just the lake of fire. I mean, it's a horrible place. It's if that's your out of the frying pan of the frying pan, that's your last reference right there. You saw it in verse number 14 to the word hell, and it is hell in the King James Bible. That's why we preach hell. That's why we warn folks about hell. That there's a remedy that you're going to go there one day if you don't take the sin payment that Jesus Christ made on that cross for your, your sins. Now, I need, honestly, I need, I need four minutes of your time. Go to, go to, a, go to Psalms, please. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, and I don't mean to. Something about the soul. People, people are going to argue with you or get into it with you when you witness to them that we just go to the ground. We just go to the grave. There's nothing more than uh, our earthly existence, our fleshly existence, and then that's it. You're just going to go sleep forever or whatever. You have major cults that teach that. Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, moron, uh, Mormons. No, they're morons. Mor uh, morons, all that stuff. Well... I'm going to show you, Lord willing, just give me a couple minutes. Go to Psalm 88. Psalm 88. I'm sorry if I didn't give you the reference. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you Psalm 88. Uh, yeah. I have a question about that, too. Uh, before you were talking about the soul is the real you, and you gave a reference about it where it was defined. Luke 9. I, I don't, the real reference is, it's, I'm telling you, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, you just think you're cool and you're emulating something. No, it's on the inside column. Uh, I'll, give me a minute, Pete. Give me a minute, please. I'll, I'll give it to you. It's the inside column, buddy. It is... It is 9.25. For what is the man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself? That's the match meet to 8.36 and 37. The self, the real you, is not find yourself. It's your soul, man. It's not your outward appearance. Anyway, uh, go with me to uh, Psalm uh, 88. Peter, well, actually, no, I'm going to read these. So, not that I don't trust you. I'm just going to read, read through them here. 
Um, I, I was, well, I, I, I got pinched at the end of, for time as usual because I'm an idiot. Can you look with me at verse number uh, 88, verse 6? Actually, 88, 88, verse 5. 88, verse 5 of Psalm. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. They are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness and the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves, Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Can you see how you read that passage and go, you're dead, it's over. You're done, you're cooked. Nothing happens. God doesn't remember you. There's no praise in your lips. You don't say nothing when you're down there. It's over when you die. Can you see how you can get that out of that passage? I know, I've read their literature. That's where they go. That's where they go. Psalm 115. Please, Psalm 115 while you're right here. Psalm 115, please. I'm going to show you the verses where folks will go to say, well, you, it, it's, it's over. You go to the ground and that's you're done. Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. See, you don't talk. You don't have anything to say. You're dead is done. Now, you can take that verse and you can build a doctrine because they do. But what's the problem? You have a what? A spirit, a soul, and a body. Psalm chapter 6. Psalm chapter 6, please. Psalm chapter 6. Psalm chapter 6. Go back with me. I'm trying to give you the passages where somebody could potentially might trip you up. If you're trying to witness for the Lord, they may they may bring these up, particularly. And I honestly, folks, I tell you this: don't get in an argument with these folks. I, I know you're talking to the grand arguer and master debater of all, but honestly, you learn over the years you're not going to get anywhere with them. I have read very few conversion stories of Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, said very few of them, and they'll argue with you about Jesus was on a stake, not on a cross, and and, and people don't rise from the uh, our people are, are annihilated. And there's no hell, but. Honestly, give them the gospel and pray for them. Psalm chapter 6, title says to the chief musician upon, uh, on Neganoth, upon Shemin at the Psalm of David, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chase me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of thee, in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Please, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You see how you can take the Bible and twist it to make, make it say something that you want to say? Now, do those verses say something? Yes, they do. But as you keep reading on down the road, you understand that a man's talking about physical death and going to the body going to the grave. Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Of course, I'm telling you that so I can delay it and act like I'm all cool trying to get there. Please ask the chapter 3, please. Look at verse number, uh, look at verse 16. 316, and moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment that wickedness was there and the place of righteousness that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time, uh, for, there's a, there, for there is a time there for every purpose, for every work. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befall the sons of men befall beasts. Even one thing befall them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. That's your spirit reference. So that a man hath no preeminence over uh, above a beast for all his vanity. We know that's not true because Matthew 12, 12 says, How much better is a man than a uh, sheep? But what is Solomon's perspective? Under the what? He's talking as a man that's worn out. And yes, it's inspired scripture. There's nothing wrong with it. God put it in here. But he's giving you the view of everything under the sun. I look around. A beast dies. An 
cow dies, a, 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 a yak dies, and a man dies. What's the difference? Oh, big difference. Look what the Bible goes on to say. Look at verse 20. All go into one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. If I just read that first part, guess what it would say? All go to one place. See? No big deal. General resurrection, what's the big deal? But the rest part of that verse explains it. They all go to the what? The dust. That's where you're going to go, man. I understand some folks blew up over the Sea of Japan. I understand uh, folks got killed off the crown over in Iwo Jima. Folks died uh, uh, up in the airplane. I understand that, but you're all going back to the dust. But that's the body, not the soul, the real you. Give, give, me, uh, give me one more. Actually, give me two more. Genesis that's 30. The context is there too. That's, that's what I'm saying is that don't, don't, let them, don't let them railroad you by one verse. Genesis 35. Genesis 35. I know I'm talking to folks that believe the Bible. I know I'm talking to folks that witness. But you've got to be careful. Because just when you think you're smart, somebody will show up at your doorstep and ask you a question about the 12 tribes over Revelation 7, and you sit there like a stammer an idiot. I'm not saying that happened to anybody. I'm just saying, you know, kind of a little, I'd like to go back and, well, I'd witness to the kid, then I'd kill him. That's still a sore spot. Oh, yeah, man. He's still got me, man. This stinking little jerk. Uh, 3516. 3516. The Bible says in 3516 in Genesis, okay, so we read those verses about we all go to one place and you know what's the big deal? Man and the beast the same, who cares? And death there's no remembrance of thee, and nobody can praise thee in the dirt, and who cares? We're just going to the grave. You if you talk to them with just enough folks, they'll actually say that to you. There's no soul having that. What are you talking about? We're just gonna, I'm just gonna take a dirt nap. What do they always say? May he rest in peace. Look at, 30, look at Old Testament passage, 35, 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. She's about to give, give birth to Benjamin. The Bible says in verse 17, And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin, for she died. Old Testament saying, underneath Genesis stipulations, or even before the Exodus law, and what happens when this lady dies giving birth? What departs her body? Her soul. <laughs> How many thousands of years ago was that? How come you don't read that verse? How come you don't go to that one? Well, they all, go to, they all go to Ecclesiastes and Psalms to prove that we all go to one place. You just read an Old Testament lady giving birth to Benjamin. She dies while giving having a child there. And the Bible says when she dies, her soul leaves her. Psalm, Psalm chapter 90. Last one. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Sorry that I'm rushing at the end. I didn't mean to. I'm actually half Polish, but I'm rushing right now. Psalm 90. Big difference. Yeah, oh, you better, you, that's right, Polska, that's right. Psalm chapter 90. Psalm 90, the Bible says this in verse number 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. <laughs> that's where they get the soap opera, days of our lives from. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And by reason of strength, they be four score years. In other words, you make it to 80. Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. Look at this. Not for it, that's the physical life, is soon cut off and what? We fly away. What do you mean a we? He just told you how long you're going to live physical life on average. 70 or 80 years. When you die, something gets cut off and flies away. I think it's over in, uh, please ask talks about the silver, the silver cord breaks away, it's cut loose. Amen. Now, real quick, before we, before we close, I'll tell you once, one final thing. We'll, we'll take a break. Don't worry. We won't, we won't get started in five minutes. I'll tell you one last thing. Um, Herb Cogshaw and I were out door knocking down in Farmington one day, way back in oh, a a long time ago. And we came upon a lady's house, and she was, she was a, she was Satan. She was one, she was a JW. That's just me being me, calling her Satan's witness, but that's what they were their witness for. But she was a JW. She was old, an older lady, real old. Like her, her, her great grandson came up behind. He was like 13, and she opened the door. She said that she was alive, and I don't remember which one is older, either Taisy Russell or Judge Rutherford. I don't remember. I think she said Rutherford, 
she was around with Jennifer. Those are the two guys that started the JW movement. And she said, you know, and I said, I, I was trying to, you know, trying to be my usual personal self. And I said, hey, we're throwing the, flipping the tables. We're finally knocking your door. And she goes, ha, 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 ha. Because usually JWs go around knocking doors and hanging out, handing out sleep magazines and all that stuff. And Herb and I were talking to her and I said, can I show you two verses from the Bible? Well, I don't really, because they won't really let you show me. And by the way, I won't take a gospel track. I showed her the Genesis 35, 18 one. And she goes, I have never seen that before. Amen. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying it because of me. And then I took her over 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and I said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body. She goes, nobody has ever showed that to me before. I said, ma'am, you have a spirit, a soul, and a body. There's a difference. And I said, even in the Old Testament, the soul leaves the body when you die. I said, you need to check into that before it's eternally too late. And she goes, thank you. When we turn around that. You never know. Opportunity to witness. Brother Guido, pray for us. We can pull close to the Sunday school, please. There are a lot of making praise for the Lord God. Those that were tortured and praying for us and not taking life in the world. Amen. We put our understanding to your word to protect our hearts and to be busy about doing the business, spreading the gospel. Amen. We put our eyes off the foolishness of this world and it's not going to be here at this time. Amen. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Christ in Amen. Amen. We'll take a break. No, we won't start reading the next couple minutes because I was being my usual long way so. Down in the valley or upon the mountain. Pete, I love that face mask. That's the best. You got the keys? If, if, they have, if you have to go to the bathroom, Haley's doing the same.